So if you go on the internet, you can see a, a significant percentage of whatever people post there is angry and critical about others to the point of saying, these are all awful people, awful. And so those are the patterns that come when you live for, for years and years and years and years and years identified with the conditioned mind. And then you grow old and you bang a cranky old man or woman. <laughs> but this has been going on for decades already. It just becomes more and more rigid. Anyway, you are not going that way. But we need to see what we are up against, <laughs> which is your mind. It's not an enemy, but you need to see that it's been the momentum that is there, it, it's been there, been growing for thousands of years. And it's been a wonderful thing, a wonderful evolutionary development to have a thinking mind, except that it has absorbed almost everything to, into itself. Your entire conscious, consciousness has become absorbed by really is no more than an instrument. An instrument for communication, an instrument for dealing with things in this practical realm, an instrument for manifesting even, but nevertheless an instrument. So, just as in the movie theater, even much more so in the movie theater, everything demands your attention. External things and your mind. And this is, we are here in order to deepen our ability to live from a different state of consciousness where the thinking mind is transcended, can still operate, still does operate, but you have stepped beyond it. You, which is the consciousness, you are the consciousness. So the entire essence of spiritual life is not, one could say, is not to have your consciousness continuously being absorbed by primarily your mind and sense perceptions. In the Bhagavad Gita, there is an, the analogy of the wild the horses that are drawing the carriage in which Arjuna uh, travels and Krishna, I think. And the horses represent the sensory organs uh, which continuously take your attention out. Now that was two or two thousand years or more ago. Nowadays what demands, what absorbs your attention even more than externals is your mind. So as you walk around here, the, our retreat place, outside or inside, look at, you take everything in, your sense perceptions, of course. But see if you can be aware of yourself, in addition to being aware of whatever you happen to be aware of at that moment, people, nature, objects, the sky, walking. In addition to being aware of whatever you're aware of, can you be aware of yourself? 
not the historical self that gets restless and impatient, but yourself as the conscious, the unconditioned consciousness, which is the same as what emerges when you listen to the silence right now, that, that self. Can you be aware while you're walking, sitting, eating, listening to people, or listening to other sounds, can you be aware of the fact that you are aware, which means to be aware of yourself as the consciousness. That's a new way of living, and that's why we're here, in order to deepen our ability to live from that level that frees you from believing that all there is to you is your historical person, the little me. And that's a wonderful liberation. It's not that, that it no longer exists, the historical person continues to exist. It will also, the egoic self, if you identify with it, it becomes the ego. If you simply observe it, it's just the historical self. That's the difference. If you lose awareness, your historical person becomes an entity that you think is you. That's delusion. But if you're aware, the historical entity is still there, your person, you, your personal history, or, the, or whatever is in your mind is still there, but you, let's use a Buddhist term, you recognize that it is not who you are. And the Buddhist term would be, you recognize it as no, not self. That's, and that's an enormous liberation. So it's not, we're not eliminating who you are as a person. <laughs> we are just adding a dimension to it, or rather, we don't do anything, we don't add it. We discover that there is another dimension to you. And then you begin to live from that deeper dimension, whereas the historical person and the, the person, the personality, it still operates but not as you anymore. It operates as a person. That means you become aware of your thoughts, you, become, you still have your opinions, but yourself isn't in your opinions, which means you hold them more lightly. You are not possessed by your opinions, because otherwise humans that have no awareness, they don't have opinions. The opinions have them. <laughs> they don't even have thoughts. The thoughts have them. <laughs> so that's the shift is the person remains, but there is a suddenly a depth to you that was there all the time. But because of the seductive or hypnotic nature of sensory experience and more importantly mental experience you didn't know it was there you didn't know the dimension of depth you had been seduced out of the de of the depth of who you are onto just the surface level of life <laughs> thoughts and Prince perceptions, <laughs> surface. And it becomes a very unsatisfying experience to live on the surface of life only. <laughs> because on the surface of life, nothing is fulfilling for very long. So there's the continuous search. Now, because of the momentum that's behind the conditioned self, you may find that even here, from time to time, although the environment is conducive to awareness, to presence, to being the 
unconditioned consciousness. Nevertheless, there's such momentum to the mind, it will from time to time take you over again, probably or possibly, some of you. And so, you, it, even here you may lose awareness and get totally absorbed again in the, in the mind. not present, absent, somewhere. And then the moment comes when you notice it. It could be a moment when you feel restlessness, impatience, irritation with something, upset, complaining, angry, all the usual things that accompany inevitably the personal sense of self. <laughs> All the things that many persons are addicted, addicted to because it strengthens their personal selfhood, self, their personal self. They're addicted to those patterns. addicted to being right, which means somebody else has to be wrong, otherwise you can't be right. <clears throat> and you can go on the internet, if you have nothing else to do to strengthen your ego, no other great achievements, you feel, I did that, look at me. Okay, well, I can't think of anything that I did look at me, but I can go on the internet and I can make a hundred people wrong and then wait for a response. <laughs> they are so-called trolls, trolls troll on the internet, they, uh, they leave uh, posts that are offensive or extremely angry and they, it's an ego device that didn't exist before for the, the advent of the internet. Uh, an ego device for those who have nothing else they can identify with. That's good enough. If I can make 10 people wrong a day as I sit behind my computer, that's good enough for my ego. It can, it can enhances itself every day through that. <laughs> and the more people respond, the better. I'm just giving examples of extreme forms of unconsciousness, which are very common, of course. But little remnants of those things you may occasionally discover in yourself. even here. <laughs> so there is a pull to the mind. You cannot fight it, you can only be aware of it. This mind-made sense of self is also much more focused on the negative than the positive. To be free, you awaken to who you are beyond your history and your life situation.